I'm Kevin Cirilli with Bloomberg News. We're here with Richard Trumpka, the head of the AFL-CIO. Thank you for being with Bloomberg. Thanks for having me on. Let's get right into it. You've been praiseworthy of the president's tariff proposals. Why? Well, because tariffs are the only way that you have to endorse or to make sure that cheaters uh, are held accountable and you have fair trade. Uh, what we've seen is a number of countries have been cheating. Nothing's been done about it, and we've paid the price for that. Who's cheating? Well, a number of countries. We have, right now in this country, we have 435 tariffs that were imposed because one country or another or one industry in that country or another has been cheating. Uh, everybody uses tariffs. Every country, the EU, India, China, everybody uses tariffs to enforce the law because they're a common sense uh, way to enforce trade laws, and we haven't had that before. I want to pick up on China in particular because they really are doing backdoor dumping, so to speak, or flooding the markets of other countries in order to, to, to take advantage of, of the U.S. policy. So why were Mexico and Canada excluded from this if they're, they still have that relationship with China? Well, China does put steel in through other countries. Uh, but the relationship with Canada, they've been playing by the rules. Uh, Mexico, less so, but they've been playing by the rules. Mexico still cheats on the wage side. They still don't enforce their trade laws, their labor laws, and so they get a, an unfair advantage that way. Uh, but, but quite frankly, from this tariff, they should not be, uh, they should be exempted from it. Do you think this is going to actually have a, a, a positive effect on the economy? Oh, I do. And, and you know, you, you have the chicken littles on Wall Street right now that are on suicide watch because what they do is they close down factories and mills in the U.S. and they relocate them overseas. And then they even make fatter profits whenever those places where they're located cheat on the trade laws. So they don't care about the social and economic costs of unfair trade because workers in our communities pay the price while they uh, reap the harvest and, and the profit. This is going to take some of that away and allow us to have a fairer trade. Look, President Obama issued a tariff, steel tariffs on nine countries. Those tariffs ranged from 10% to 118%, 118%. Nobody yelled, trade war, trade war, <laughs> the sky is falling, the sky is falling, because they knew they were cheating. But the let me, let me follow up this, because when you, when you criticize Wall Street in particular, Goldman Sachs came out with a report that said that the profits of GM and Ford, they would lose $1 billion in profits. Won't that hurt the worker? I mean, what's your response to, this, to the criticism from the likes of Wall Street that say that this could hurt workers? Wait, wait a second. I, I really think it's nice for Wall Street to have crocodile tears over some other industry while they walk away with so many billions of dollars every day because of what they do overseas. And they don't care about trade enforcement. They don't have to pay the price for trade enforcement. They're not going to see, we're not going to see uh, that kind of negative activity. They like to point to the tariff of, tra of George Bush. When he put a tariff on steel and then he took it back, there was no negative economic effect. It, it was not even measurable. But one thing did happen. Shuttered steel mills came back to life. You think this Americans, is going to reopen wheels? Americans went back to work. You think this is going to reopen steel plants? I think you're going to see steel plants that are going to expand their capacity. Yeah. They'll go from operating at 40% to 80% or 100% of capacity. You'll see some callbacks in it because we're taking away the cheat factor. Taking so, away the chief factor, is this going to end up then not hurting jobs or losing jobs? Do you think this is going to create jobs? I do. I think it's going to create jobs. Look, when you enforce laws, everybody gets a fair playing yeah. field. That's what this is about and nothing more. And their chicken little attempts to say this is going to cause a catastrophe just don't hold water. Yeah. Because if it were... We have 435 tariffs right now that are in place. Mm -hmm. EU has tariffs in place. India has tariffs in place to stop companies and countries 
that are cheating. I want to get to politics in a second, but I want to stay with this notion of trade because NAFTA talks are nearing completion, as you know. What do you think is, how do you think the administration is doing with regards to the NAFTA renegotiations? Have you been satisfied? Well, I, we'll have to see what, what to comes see. out of it. I mean, what we need is a strong labor chapter, and there's four or five other things that need to be done. We need strong rules of origin. We need strong procurement laws. We need to take away the special courts for foreign investors, mm -hmm. investors that only they can go into. Most of all, we need a strong, strong labor chapter so that the wages in Mexico can rise. When the Mex wages in Mexican workers goes up, they become consumers. They can buy our products. Uh, can it Canada and the U.S., we don't have that problem. Wall Street corporations would argue that those same judicial, international judicial boards uh, actually help to, to maintain uh, some order of, of regularity, some enforcement procedures worldwide. Uh, I take it you don't agree with that. <laughs> it's inadequate. We, we just filed a case against uh, a country in Central America. Eight years later, there was a, a decision that was a, a not a decision. Uh, so the, the enforcement mechanisms are inadequate. One of the few ways you have to enforce uh, trade laws and to hold people accountable and end the cheating is through tariffs. And that's why this is such a normal, common sense thing that Wall Street is on suicide watch over. Mr. Trump, with regards to the politics of this, Speaker Ryan was against this. Ba basically, uh, Leader McCarthy was against this. A lot of top Republicans were against this. President Trump ignoring them, largely. So what I'm hearing, and you've been critical of President Trump in the past, but what I'm hearing is that you agree with him on this particular policy with trade. I do. And l listen, uh, Pro, or Speaker Ryan has been in favor of tariffs in the past. If you look in the Republicans' uh, literature for a better way, their better way <laughs> agenda, it's replete with instances where they say there ought to be tariffs. Yeah. So what, what they get is pressure from their donors, their Wall Street donors. They say, Paul, this is going to cut into our profits overseas. You must do something. So Paul says, oh, this is bad. We won't do that. I, again, I want to emphasize something. They, their hair's on fire right now because they make money by closing factories here and relocating them overseas, and they make more money when they cheat on the, on the trade laws. So us insisting that we have fair trade laws and everybody play by the same rules is discomforting to them because it cuts into the profit but it's fair to the American public. You know, in researching for this interview, I was reading an interview that you gave a couple of months ago where you said that President Trump had not kept promises that he had done on the campaign trail. Is this a promise that he's kept? Going out, having fair trade? Yes. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, because he said he would renegotiate NAFTA. Mm -hmm. He's in the process of doing that. We'll see the product. Uh, but he's in the process of doing things. This is something that needed to be done. It needed to be done, and it is a fair, common-sense way to enforce trade laws mm -hmm. that are being cheated upon. With regards to where the state of politics is right now, and, and we've seen uh, the president in his rhetoric, and as well as this week with the, with the announcement of these tariffs, take the Republican Party in a bit of a different direction than the likes of Speaker Ryan would like to see. You've been a longtime player in this, in this debate. You've watched it for quite some time unfold. Where do you think, sir, the Republican Party is headed with regards to trade? Is it moving in a, a direction that, that you are, are more comfortable with, or is it moving in one that, that you're less comfortable Look, with? Look, the Republican Party has always been in favor of unfettered free trade without regard to the consequences at home. Mm -hmm. they, were the, they passed NAFTA. Remember people what would, happened? Uh, people it, would it, maybe it, disagree and well, say that. The let me let me <laughs> let me give yeah. you the facts. Yeah. You had a Democratic president. You had a three or four Democrats, and you had a barrel full of Republicans that voted for NAFTA. That's how NAFTA got passed. And then you had China PNTR. Yes. That was a Republican initiative. Yes. And initiative after initiative, the Republican Party has done this. And remember this. Most of these agreements really aren't trade agreements. They're finance agreements. They're to let people make money 
by relocating overseas. Their biggest donors, the Republican Party's biggest donors, make a lot of money by moving factories overseas. You tweeted out earlier, just the other day, I think it was yesterday, after this announcement with trade about a place where, where you're pretty familiar with. You grew up there, and that's southwestern Pennsylvania. The president's headed there ahead of the special election. Vice President Joe Biden has, has been in the area as well, uh, speaking, rallying folks. How is this trade talk going to play in this special election, PA Congressional District 18? Well, it's got nothing to do with Ciccone, uh, who's the Republican candidate up there against a, a candidate by the name of Connor Lamb. Connor Lamb supports jobs in that area. Ciccone wants to roll back Medicare, roll back Medicaid, and roll back Social Security and privatize those. Now, I happen to know that area. There's a large, large number uh, of pension people and, and retired age people up in that area. And Zaccone, wanting to r cut back Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, is not going to play well, regardless of who goes up and says, buy this canard. But so the president is the, the trade going to play well? Well, the president, trade, trade is going to. But where is Zaccone on that? He's been on the wrong side of these issues uh, coming up. And so the president isn't going to be able to flush the record of a bad candidate. But this is what I find interesting is because Pennsylvania going Republican for the first time in a presidential election since 1988. And now you've got a situation where President Trump's going to be there. The vice president, who was deep ties in Scranton, is going to be there as well. Is this a bellwether for not even... For 2018, as folks in the chattering class, we like to say it is, but also for 2020. This, this is a, a race between a good candidate and someone who's out of touch with the people that live in that district. Connor Lamb understands the people of that district. He's a veteran. He stands up for veterans. He stands up for jobs. He stands up for Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. And the guy that he's running against is out of touch. He wants to cut the very programs that are sustaining the people in his district. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Moving forward into the midterms, what are some of the key races that the AFL-CIO will be playing in? Now, we'll be playing in a number of states, probably uh, 12 to 14 states and a number uh, of other congressional districts and a few governor's races. So Overall, how would you grade this president? This president? On most of the issues, I'd give him low grades right now. Uh, he hasn't delivered on stuff. He said he was going to do uh, a, a infrastructure program, and what he brought out was like Ted Max amateur hour. Uh, we need a trillion and a half dollars, and he proposes twenty billion a year, which won't even put a dent in what we need. So he he hasn't done things on trade. He's talking about it. But he hasn't quite gotten there yet. And as you, and just to wrap it up, as you move forward, what is the next major trade issue that you would like to see this this Congress and this administration address? Is it infrastructure? The next. The trade. next policy policy issue, rather. Well, there's a number of them. Yeah. Jobs is always at the top of that, and that's infrastructure. But that ties in trade. The tax law that was just passed, uh, that the president supported, uh, is going to make it encourage and reward people to send jobs and offshore jobs because it has a zero tax rate for any subsidiary that goes overseas. So if you can build a factory here and pay 20% or you can build it somewhere else and pay 0%, you decide where you build it. Mm -hmm. And that tax bill is going to hurt us. So when you put all of those things together, you have to say the rules have been rigged against working people. Is he or is he not changing the rules to help working people? He changed a few, but he hurt us in a lot. He got rid of regulations that protect our health and safety. He got rid of regulations that would have brought overtime to five and a half million people. He has not talked about helping people with collective bargaining so that you can actually work uh, with your employer to get a better share uh, of what you produce. All of those get tied together you, you wrap it up in a bow and you say, the positive thing he's doing in trade don't outweigh the, all the other things that he's doing to reduce the wages, the benefits, and the welfare of the American worker.
Richard Trumka, head of the AFL-CIO. Thank you so much, sir, for coming you on bet. Bloomberg. We appreciate your time. I'm Kevin Cirilli for Bloomberg News. Thank you for watching our interview.